I get asked all the time, oh, are you? They'll see the name on the hard hat. And, and I'm like, yep, yep. <laughs> this is the Wildfire Lessons Podcast. Our goal is to promote learning by revealing the complexity and risk in the wildland fire environment. We share the lessons. The learning that follows is up to you. Hi, I'm Kelly Woods, director of the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center. On today's podcast, I visit with two generations of firefighters, mother and daughter duo Beth and Allison Lund. Beth is the assistant director of operations for the U.S. Forest Service stationed at the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise, Idaho. Beth has been in the wildland fire business for 46 years. I don't think I need to say that is a long time. In her current position, Beth represents the Forest Service and high-level discussions and shapes policies with groups like the National Multi-Agency Coordinating Group, or NMAC, and the Federal Fire Management Board. She has incredible depth in her work history to support her decision-making. Allison Lund enters her 19th fire season this year as she transitions into a new position as a fire operations specialist on the Payette National Forest in Idaho. Allison is also building incredible depth as she crafts her career in a completely different era than the one her mom knew. Beth and Allison were gracious enough to sit down and share their story centered around family and what matters most. My hope is that you glean some lessons about juggling life and work. All right. I'm truly honored to be sitting down today with with the legendary (laughs) Beth Lund and her daughter, Allison, who is definitely a legend in the making. So super exciting for me. We ask you guys to to come here and visit with us a little bit about the dynamics between being a parent and a child, mother and daughter in the wildland fire culture and community. And you guys have a really cool, unique perspective. So absolutely appreciate you sitting down with me today. Absolutely. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Just to get us started, let's have you take a couple minutes to just kind of talk about where you started in fire and some of the stops along the way just to kind of orient people what your current position is. Beth, let's start with you since you've got 46 (laughs) years. Yeah. Yeah, so I started uh, working for the Forest Service in uh, 1976 in Northern California and uh, it was on the Lassen National Forest and uh, started out as a on an engine crew and then you know did a variety of different things uh, worked on the Lassen for a while uh, you know worked out of Redding uh, for a year or so in Northern California um, on the Redding hotshot crew and then eventually I went back to and worked on the Mendocino National Forest uh, also in Northern California and then at some point I decided to uh, move from California and uh, so I put in for a job in Idaho Uh, that was about 1982 83 actually and so I started uh, on the Boise National Forest in um, in in Idaho in uh, two uh, yeah 1984 four was my first full season and uh pretty much stayed in idaho uh the rest of the time and did uh you know worked as an afmo and then a fire management officer and then um i did a stint down in utah for a little bit as the deputy fire director in uh, region four the intermountain region and then i have uh, my last post here has been in the washington office at uh, the national interagency fire center still working for the forest service i've been pretty much all my life with the forest service i uh, haven't gone back and forth and I'm currently the Assistant Director for Operations for Washington Office Fire and Aviation, posted at NIFC. That's such an impressive resume. I mean, and not to mention going all the way up to, you know, Type 1 IC and running some pretty awesome crews in the basin. So, yeah, awesome, awesome resume. And I think it's worth mentioning, too, the 80s were epic fire seasons yeah. on the Boise, right? Yeah, you're right. The 80s there were pretty active. Uh, seems like the 90s were a little bit more mellow for the most part, you know, generalizing. But uh, yeah. It's funny. My my first memory of you, Beth, I, I certainly had heard your name. I was working up on the Payette at the time. And 
I came down to the Great Basin Training Center for what was then called supervision training. You know, it was mm-hmm. it was certainly not the leadership curriculum. It was supervisory 101 or whatever it was. And I remember you were on that cadre, and I remember thinking, that's Beth Lund. Okay, you know, yeah, pretty cool. Allison, tell us how you officially got started in FIRE. I started my career right out of high school, got onto a type two crew, and then went to two other type two crews after that for three seasons on type two crews, and then got with the Boise Hotshots. I was a crew member for a long time, basically did every role on the crew, got to be a squad boss, and then ended as a captain, was on the crew for 14 years. And then uh, this last year, I got a job with the regional office as a contract equipment specialist, which learned a lot of cool stuff, and it was definitely a lot different than anything I'd been used to. But with that said, uh, decided to get back into the operations side of things. So I'm currently in the transition of going back to being a fire operations specialist on the Payette National Forest. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a... It's a strange transition. I know, Beth, you've done that too, but that transition from operations, being on a crew, hanging out, doing that stuff into this office setting is really, it's just, it's a, it's a struggle. And I don't know if you're ever quite ready for it, but yeah. I think that another dynamic part of that was uh, being virtual, going from being on cruise for my whole life, basically, to sitting at my house by myself. (laughs) <laughs> which is cool to hang out with my dogs and stuff, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a little, it's odd. Yeah. That's for sure. It's definitely the pandemic's definitely added a, uh, for two years now, added a extra layer of, I don't know what to call it, um, a different way to exist in the workplace, I guess, or not in the workplace <laughs> for yeah. the most part. Yeah. yeah. I think it was a lot harder for people like myself that, you know, were have always been in a office setting and we didn't even know what telework was back in the day so um so it's been it's always been my ideal to you know be and it's been really weird the last two years even in our suite at NIFSI just a couple of us at a time there occasionally and uh you just really miss the uh, human interaction yeah yeah well let's get, talk a little bit about what brought you into fire and what that was like for both of you because you know obviously decades apart and beth did you have anyone in your family that was working in fire or are you first generation yeah no i'm first generation i was uh i was actually a city kid i was raised in uh the bay area uh california and uh i'd gone to junior college there for a couple of years and um met, um, you know, my first partner, uh, you know, and he and I decided we were going to go up to the junior college. I couldn't afford a four-year college in those days. And so a lot of, a lot of folks in my generation went to the, the, we called them junior colleges or community colleges. And so we went to the Lassen Community College and took forestry. Interesting thing there is, uh, you know, that was in 1976, 74, four and five, I guess, is when I went to college up there. And right out of high school, just like Allison, um, pretty much, uh, I graduated high school in 73, but they had forestry. And uh, so immediately my partner there decided he was going to take fire, but they had, and they had fire and surveying and timber, and there was one other recreation. And, uh, they steered me away from fire and so (laughs) of course (laughs) so I took the recreation venue and two year but I did get an associate's degree so if uh, nothing else I at least got a degree out of it (laughs) better than me (laughs) (laughs) so how I got my start then was the FMO from the Lassen National Forest came out to do some recruiting at the college and I believe that was right when uh, the Forest Service was about to deal with the litigation, which became the consent decree 
uh, I didn't had no idea at the time, of course, but they were they were specifically trying to recruit some diversity, some primarily females. But nonetheless, they they recruited quite a few folks, and so my um, my partner and I both got hired, as well as quite a few other folks, uh, or invited to come out. And anyway, they hired us uh, as GS. Uh, I actually started as a GS three because I did have a couple of years of college, so that was helpful. Um, that's I, big money. <laughs> that was big money. Yeah, so that's how I got my start. I don't want to go too much further, but I I started on an engine on the Lassen National Forest in Chester, California, which is kind of a cool little town so cool do you remember your parents having a reaction like you're doing what or yeah yeah my mom was uh, (laughs) she was like what uh she was raised on a farm so she was definitely had an outdoor sense about her but uh when you and then when she realized that I got on a fire crew um but but you know she didn't really like overreact she was just like oh goodness you know and but we were up there by ourselves so I said it's it's gonna be fine (laughs) and so uh yeah she she but I kept in touch with her and um I think she worried a little bit but you know hard to tell because we were apart and uh, all we had was the phone at that point in time so (laughs) yeah it's not like you could get on a Skype or anything you know (laughs) see reactions but mm -hmm. yeah yeah Allison how about you I mean obviously you were raised around fire culture you had you know as your mom progressed there in Loman and Garden Valley. I mean, you probably knew everyone who worked there, all the things. It was very much, you had fire on the landscape all the, all the time around you. So growing up in that culture versus not growing up in that culture, when did you kind of think, yeah, maybe I'll give this a try? I don't really know that I, I guess I probably did have some forethought about it, but I kind of really just feel like Yeah, I mean, it was basically a family community type thing, especially back then when when I grew up in Loman, Idaho, uh, basically everybody from Loman was in the Forest Service. And so, yeah, we um, had softball games. We, you know, it was kind of like a little family. So it was kind of, like you said, all around me. And so I guess it was kind of the easy path for me. I mean, I did really well in school and stuff like that. And so I kind of had a decision point where, like, was I going to go to college or, you know, what was I going to do? And so I actually started working at the front desk when I was in, like, middle school in Loman, um, greeting visitors and and stuff like that. And so I did that. So I was kind of already engaged in in the system. And so uh, when I graduated high school, I had some scholarships um, academic scholarships, and then actually was had a volleyball scholarship to go to Eastern Oregon, but I had injured my shoulder, so I decided against that, and uh, and so I, I did sign up for school, so I just did a short season, my first season, went to school, never have really been a huge fan of school, and so, I mean, I tried it out, I actually did it for, I think, uh, well, the first year I did a full full year, um, and then the next two, I just did one semester a piece, and my scholarships ran out, and I was over it. Uh, so that's when I got on the Hotshot crew and just kind of went with that. And, you know, it was once again a family to me, and I was, you know, outside, and I'm not a huge people person either. So uh, it was great to, you know, just be in that setting, working hard with a bunch of other people that just want to work hard and be outside. So it just kind of fit me. Yeah. Would you say you two are personality wise fairly similar? Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. It was, it was funny. I um, just thinking about this podcast, knowing we were going to sit down, I did call Dion Berner, you know, the superintendent of the Boise Hotshots, who, of course, worked for you, Beth, for a number of years. Yeah. And then Allison, you went on to work for Dion for a number of years. And I thought, Dion's and he's a great guy, right? Super great guy. I thought Dion's going to have a fun perspective. And so, first of all, when I said we were going to sit down, he was like, "That's so cool." He was like, <laughs> "Yeah, that is very cool." I feel like he was probably like, "Oh boy." <laughs> no, he was excited. And and he said, "The first thing I can say is Allison is 100% self-made. She has not had anything handed to her. She's proven herself and she's 
built her career and her reputation exclusive from the reputation of you, Beth. And, and I think that's a tribute to you in the way you managed that. And it's a tribute to you, Allison, in the way that you've charted your own course, even in, you know, the shadow, right? You've, you've done it. And I, I thought that was really cool the way Dion articulated that. And then he said, they are both very direct and, you know, good communicators. Like, you know what they're thinking. They don't beat around the bush. But he said... Beth has been a great mentor to me and to many, many other people. He said it's been amazing the leadership that she's shown and how she's helped develop people. And he said, Allison is developing into the exact same thing. So I thought it was kind of interesting, you know, to to hear him talk about you totally cold. I cold called him, you know, he didn't know I was going to, I didn't say, hey, let's visit. So, so that was pretty cool. So, so Beth, at, at, you know, one point it's it's obvious Allison is going to you know venture into the to the fire fire world fire career. You know, what were you thinking? Did you have any concerns? No, not really. It's like any parent, though. It makes you reflect a little bit more on the job you've been doing for uh, several years. Uh, I have to tell one story when uh, I I was uh, an incident commander, I think type two, and I think, I can't remember exactly where we were, but we were in the Great Basin somewhere uh, when she was on, uh, I think a crew out of Eastern uh, Idaho. And uh, it was the first time that, and so she literally avoided me. (laughs) She she did not want to uh, be thought of as being, you know, teacher's pet, as it were. Oh, you know, I have an in here. So I kind of hunted her down after, uh, you know, because I wasn't going to, you know, and we were busy doing in briefings and stuff and their crew was getting, you know, had just gotten there. But so in the dark of night out in the parking lot, we met up. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, anyway, we just chatted and I said, oh, it's cool that you're here and stuff. Stuff. And uh, I think after that, you know, the ice was broken. But I think, you know, I would have probably been similar because her, neither her or I are extroverts, really. Um, that that would be left to her brother. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, we. But but then after that, you know, she would come up and uh, she she didn't ever want to come up like right after the briefing or something. But but if she saw me standing by myself or something, uh, she she if she had time, she'd come over and say hi. Or if she was doing a medical run for the crew or something uh, and had to come, you know, into the camp proper, <laughs> she'd uh, she'd uh, look me up. So yeah, but it was interesting that first time. You know, she was like, oh boy, I don't yeah. know if I wanted anybody to know that that's my mom. I wanted to know. <laughs> part of that actually um yeah I just it was like like you said that Dion mentioned I didn't want any I didn't want it to be looked at as like I was given anything you know and so I just wanted to be to myself especially when you're in that crew setting and you know you're all lined out and walking to chow and stuff hey mom like what's up like no that's not gonna happen I just wanted to wait until after you know and then I don't like I was I probably was kind of an asshole you know like uh, to to my mom which I kind of felt bad about after but uh it's like no this is not the time or place I don't feel comfortable so uh we just you know uh met up later on but yeah then then I started reflecting once I grew up a little bit more and I was like well I guess it's not a huge you know, detriment or whatever. It wasn't a detriment by any means. I'm super proud of my mom. But uh, yeah, it was just weird to have her be the boss of everybody. I, I, I have to, if I can, Kelly, yeah, you absolutely. know, um, have to tell a story about when these guys were very young kids, because I always wondered, and I don't even know if I've ever asked Allison if she even remembers anything about it. I'm sure she does because she, well, they were super young, but in 1989, the Loman fire came right through and it barreled right up Highway 21. And I was the AFMO at the time, so I was the initial attack incident commander, or well, extended. Anyway, I was a Type 3 IC there. And and so they were at home, and uh, we could tell that it was going to come down into town. And so I remember, uh, you know, and again, cell phones weren't really a thing then, well, not in Loman anyway. And so, um, you know, I can't remember, I believe uh, her dad was at home, but uh, again, I didn't have the means to communicate with him. But long story short, uh, we had to evacuate the town. And so I remember 
uh, telling everybody I was going to take a minute and go gather my kids up. And uh, this friend of mine who was, you know, <laughs> kind of, I don't, I wouldn't, she was just, uh, she, she, she was a friend and uh, she, when you she, live in Loman, Idaho, you make friends with whoever. You want. <laughs> Limited options. And so I said, "Hey, uh, can you uh, can you come and because my my uh, husband uh, was up on the roof, well, not up on the roof, but he was trying to pre- prepare to you know the the house uh, to you know receive fire, and we lived right on the corridor. But anyway, I just remember I have these memories of um, you know Casey was one, and I think she was two or two and a half, and." Um, I remember, and there was no seatbelts in my friend's car and her boy, her long-haired boyfriend and stuff. And so I said, can you come get my kids? I've called their grandmother from Boise and she's going to, you know, that we were evacuating people to the Deadwood campground. And so she said, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll come get them. And so they came and I remember throwing my one-year-old and her in the back seat, no seatbelts, <laughs> with a diaper bag and a few things. And I had called my mother-in-law. And uh, the next thing I know, I drove. I went back and got in my government vehicle, and I saw them at the Haven Lodge. And she said, "Well, we th- we just thought we'd get the kids some ice cream first. Oh. <laughs> just like, <laughs> good grief! I go, you guys need to get Share out. Share my sense of urgency, <laughs> please." <laughs> so, uh, so they did. Uh, she did get them down there and found my mother-in-law because I'm sure there was hordes of people, you know, being evacuated. And so I always wondered if that left an imprint. I don't think my son was old enough to really remember he was a baby but I mean I don't really know I I'm, I I can kind of picture stuff but I think I don't know if it's from hearing the stories yeah. or whatever but I mean I kind of feel like I, I somewhat remember that as being chaotic time but there was lots of chaotic times when mom was just gonna you know go and work it was I don't know maybe yeah. I just numb to it but yeah I that was probably there's my start to the yeah, Fire. there's your there's yeah. your indoctrination. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. You mentioned Casey, your son, um, and your brother Allison. What's his reaction when he's together with you two, who are so similar in these similar career paths? And uh, yeah, how does how does he hold his own when it comes to hanging out at the holidays or whatever? <laughs> well, it, it probably made him a stronger person because we're both pretty <laughs> pretty strong people, and uh, so yeah, he. Uh, I think he dealt with it fine. I don't know if Allison has any reflections. <laughs> yeah, um, that's it's kind of a loaded question. Um, For we'd sure. be bleeping stuff out a lot <laughs> if we went into <laughs> divulgence on that. But no, we we all were like the Three Stooges, kind of. You know, we're like like you said, me and my mom are are very similar, and so we're both kind of his moms. And um, I mean, she she was working a lot too, so I'm. I am kind of uh, somewhat of a mom type figure to him as well, and um, yeah, he's just he's definitely a little bit different than us. He he's a people pleaser, and he uh, you know is much more boisterous than and we out, are and outgoing. outgoing. That's funny. Uh, yeah, he he definitely deals with both of us well, but uh, he definitely refers to us both as crazy. <laughs> So, yeah, there might be another adjective in there as well. But. Well, his nickname for me was always Crazy Boots. Yeah. That's perfect. That's because I think he remembers the boots always, you know. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah. That's funny. <laughs> Thinking about, you know, in this kind of context, I mean, whether Casey's there or he's not, when you guys are together, do you talk about work much? I mean, is it like, oh, we had this shift or, wow, this meeting or, you know, how has that been or how has that evolved for you in terms of work talk? Well, I can go first. It was a, to me, it was an opportunity to get a, because I always knew Allison would give me a honest perspective <laughs> and then some, uh, you know, of like, oh, this is all messed up here or whatever. But, but from, you know, being an incident commander, or ops chief, whatever, I think for most of the time after she got in the forest service, I was either type two or type one incident commander, but I could, I could get some honest feedback about, you know, I mean, in a course 
course, I didn't ever ask about the food because we all know what happens when you ask about the fire camp food. But, but I just, like it. So. <laughs> well, I kind of do too. So that's another thing we're similar. Um, but uh, just you know, just in general. But but we would talk, and you know, and I didn't like do a twenty questions thing, but I would sometimes you know, glean something from what she said or, she, you know, whatever. And of course, I think I always felt the normal parent thing, like, in and knowing more about the whole system, I was always kind of concerned about, okay, well, who's she working for on, on which division? And, you know, because we all do there's that. There's a difference. Yeah. yeah, there's a difference. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, that was my perspective. Yeah, we definitely ha- uh, don't have a no work talk policy i don't really know what we would talk about if we had that policy so yeah, it's pretty <laughs> pretty central to yeah who you are it's really both, basically yeah. both of our lives um and so yeah i uh we i i definitely we've had our uh differences and we continue to have our differences you know at certain points but it never causes any strife and like i was actually going to say the same thing as her is you know, it gives a different perspective to both of us. Like I'm frustrated from the ground, you know, being on the ground and having these frustrations of what I think, uh, higher ups should be doing or what they're not doing. And then, you know, she has the perspective of what is actually going on, whether it's fast or slow or whatever it might be, what the hangups are, what the, you know, what they're dealing with up, up above um, at that higher level is uh, just different perspectives. Like she mentioned, I think it has been helpful for both of us to kind of pass on and and affect change to a certain extent in both of our areas of expertise. Yeah, I think that's such a huge thing, because just as you can kind of ground truth with Allison, Beth, what the decisions you're making from a policy level in your you know current position or IC type decisions, I think it's hard sometimes to know when you're in that, you know, you know, on a crew type position to understand the complexities that are happening in places like NMAC or at NWCG, those those complexities are so real and there's so much stress trying to make the best decision literally for you know the boots on the ground so that's a that's a pretty cool dynamic to have allison would you say um you know i like like i said so many of us women in the business i mean this was you know i've been in for a while now too uh look at your mom as a mentor and have you been able to appreciate that for yourself too, um, outside of just being your mom, being a mentor, but really her work, you know, what she's done in her career, because trying to carve out your own path, um, which is completely respectable, have you given yourself the opportunity to also, you know, look at those attributes and, and see how she's fought to to arrive at the top, you know, I mean, a type one, I see the assistant director of operations in, I mean, it, that doesn't really get much higher than that in our world. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah, for sure. It definitely took me a while to, to make that full connection. I mean, I've always known, you know, and been aware that, uh, you know, she, she works super hard and is super devoted to everything she does and has done for the agency and for, IMTs and and all sorts of different things, I, women too, or or whatever. I'm I'm kind of not really on that bandwagon so much, but uh, but yeah, I definitely uh, the last probably, I'd say maybe ten years, but maybe even less than that, have like fully uh, appreciated, you know, who she who she is and what she's accomplished, which is pretty substantial. I mean. You could talk to anybody in the Great Basin and they know who she is. I mean, even though she doesn't know who lots of people are, you know, I get asked all the time, oh, are you? They'll see the name on the hard hat and and I'm like, yep, yep. (laughs) And uh, so it makes that connection. Granted, uh, I still, and that's why I struggled, I think, for so long is because of that name connection. It's like, oh, you're Beth Lund's daughter. If somebody didn't know me, you know, I didn't want that perception but then you know at a certain point you're just like comfortable with yourself and who you are and so then you don't even care anymore so 
I, I am super proud that we share the same name and stuff. So, uh, yeah, it, it definitely took me a while, but super proud of everything she's done. Would you say, Allison, that there's like one attribute that your mom brings to the table professionally that is just something you really work to emulate? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think the thing that sticks out most for me is something that, that she's always said that she, the reason she does what she does is to, uh, take care of the firefighters on the ground. And so I definitely try, have tried to make that a point of, of my focus, um, is to make sure that people are taken care of and steps are being followed and, and communications happening both from the bottom to the top and the top to the bottom so that um, people know why they're there, what their objectives are, and, and that they are safe, you know. And that's always been instilled from her to me for sure. Beth, I'd throw it to you and ask the same question. As you've seen Allison grow up and evolve as a person and evolve as as a fire leader, is there an attribute in her that you just in just are so proud of the way she's developing? Absolutely. I mean, I can see I can see myself in her to some extent, but she's also different. You know, we're all different and she's lived in a different era. Um, and, and so it creates a, a, you know, sometimes better, but always different, um, opportunities. For example, I mean, you know, in the seventies, uh, you spoke when you were spoken to, you didn't, uh, you didn't ask questions <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, you know, it was kind of like, uh, put your head down and dig. And, uh, you know, and I, I thought, you know, and everybody back then just took that as, you know, it's just how it is. I mean, um, there, but I, she's grown up in a different era where, you know, you can have a voice, uh, and you can, you know, feel comfortable enough about, you know, trying to point something out. Uh, and so, you know, I'm definitely proud of her and I definitely always was cognizant of respecting that concern or I don't, I don't know if concern's the right word um like because I I didn't want her to be in the shadow as it were or something you know because I never and I've never had that opinion of myself I mean I'm I'm kind of kind of one of my favorite terms that I learned probably I don't know somewhere between 15 20 years ago was you know, uh, servant leader. And I, I mean, I think you need to be humble, um, always, um, because you never know at all. And sometimes you can learn something from a first year firefighter that is, is poignant, you know, and, uh, it's like, Oh, I never looked at it like that, or I never thought about it like that, you know, so you should always be open to other perspectives, but I've certainly learned a lot from her and from that generation, you know, um, because they have been given the opportunity to, you know, be mo a little bit more educated. You know, I, I mean, I think our training has improved. I remember when I took, uh, uh, we called it uh, guard school back then or something. They always had weird words for it. <laughs> it was, um, you know, I'm learning about how to tell if there's a stump hole, if there's gnats there, that there's heat. <laughs> and, you know, some obscure things that the old timers would teach us. But I guess... I don't know even why that popped up, but it always pops into my head about the gnats. But uh, <laughs> because it's not something that you teach in fire school nowadays, at least it I don't should think. be. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, but anyways, uh, I've just been proud of her, and I and again, I always wanted to respect the the position that you know she's in, um, and uh, so I never tried to be overbearing I but I you know in my own mind like I said I always had kept my, my eye on uh, you know what crew she was on and who she's working for and stuff like that just out of just being a mom I guess <laughs> yeah for sure Beth I, I would also ask you you know the roles you've played and the influence you've had in the entire not just forest service but the entire wildland fire program you know, as you are set to retire here soon, do you feel like you're you're leaving a better culture than the one you entered? A better culture for uh, people like Allison or people who are brand new coming in? What what do you feel about that? The culture that's there in in just general. 
Well, I, I'm a little sensitive about, am I leaving that? <laughs> I feel You've like, been a part of yeah, the, you know, I, the evolution. I feel, yes, uh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think there was a question um, I noticed, you know, when you sent us just, you know, generally what we were going to talk about. It talked about who who your mentors were or, you know, and, and I definitely have some specific uh, people. They were all men, um, but I I've never... I just have not been keen on separating the male female thing. Now, obviously it's, it's there. Um, but I feel like you, you know, when I got into it, I could see immediately. And again, in the seventies, there was just when there was a starting to be more women hired in, in fire positions because there was a lot of concerns and, uh, it's much like Allison said before, a few of the conversations I had when I was just a young firefighter and questions that males would ask were interesting, to say the least, uh, you know, from a, from a lack of just understanding, you know, physical differences. <laughs> but 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 I think uh, my work ethic's always been, and I learned that from my mother, is you just need to work hard and do your best and always bring your best, you know, to the game. And so I think that serves everybody well. Um, but I, you know, always been sensitive to ever having any kind of special treatment. And, you know, when I started... Uh, the 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 situation in fire camps and and even PPE we were still 1976 was when we were just on the brink of switching to Nomex so we when I first uh, went on fires we were in jeans isn't and, that crazy to think about <laughs> yeah and uh, you know when you'd go to fire camps the showers consisted of some garden hose and some tarps and some um, pallets and you know, it's, I mean, and not all of them, because I wasn't in California, well, I was in California, but, uh, you know, you know, I'm sure there was some fancy ones, uh, particularly in South Ops, (laughs) but it was a lot more archaic uh, than, than, you know, it, it certainly, than it is now, because we've certainly developed a lot of vendors that have some sophisticated and, and good, as good as we can provide but anyway well i think i think the culture thing goes i mean i think it's beyond diversity when i think of the culture and how it's evolved since i've been working i i think about like i obviously um i'm the director of the wildland fire lessons learn center we're about to have our 20 year anniversary you know coming up next year i think that has changed us a lot culturally to to focus more on learning you know where i mean back when certainly when you started because even when I started it was it was different we didn't look to learn from events we just kind of moved forward right uh, in a in a very different way I think about the leadership curriculum you know like I referenced the supervision training that where I first um, saw you and now the this you know leadership because the leadership training you probably when you came in Allison we had that didn't we mm-hmm. that was a part of your framework yeah. always yep. um I think some of those things that have really pushed us differently culturally um, and then certainly as you say Beth the technology that's been a pretty cool thing and I I think in those leadership positions that you have held you have helped um, influence that and I have to say you know my previous job running a training center you were always on cadres for us and and that's been soup that was awesome when we could get you know a heavy hitter like you know beth lund on our on our um cadre we always really appreciated that so so i think you know i think you have to agree you've left a different you've had you have fingerprints all over the improved culture that that absolutely that you know you'll you're as you head into retirement you have to feel good yeah absolutely um you know and 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 I've had some great mentors. Uh, I've had some great female colleagues. You know, uh, when uh, when I was on the uh, Reading Hotshots, uh, myself and uh, Sue were the first two women that had ever been on that crew. Was that Sue Hasari? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And uh, and so that was. Uh, you speak of culture, and it was definitely um, culture shock for. Uh, I would say more so for those older male firefighters that had you know started fighting fire in the 
late 50s, 60s, you know, to to get their heads wrapped around, um, you know, seeing females. Uh, and and so that's where some of the questions came in, you know, that they were just uh, concerned about. Um, and another thing about culture, too, that you mentioned, Kelly, was uh, I feel like we did, we I've, I've watched the shift from safety and training to learning, <laughs> learning from unintended outcomes. And, you know, I think the battlement fire, I remember studying that one. Um, that was right, I think might have been a year before I started, 75 or 76, I can't remember. But, you know, it was a fatality fire. And uh, that was in Colorado, just real close the, to where um, South Canyon. Yes. Happened. And so, uh, you know, as I've seen the um, the stuff like you do with the Lessons Learned Center and the, the learning culture and uh, going, you know, away from, you know, safety and uh, just pure like safety and then training. And you kind of merge both of those into, you know, how do we incorporate learning from from the lessons that we we've learned? Uh, it's been fascinating to be able to watch that over the last several decades. Yeah, a lot has a lot has definitely definitely changed. You know, one of the things that we wanted to make sure we talked about was this idea of the the two generations and parenting a little bit. Like, right? What's what's that? What's that like? How has that influenced you and your decisions, Allison? So, I think. It would be really fascinating to hear you and you know i'm a i'm a mom in fire i'd love to hear kind of some advice from you how what what works well from from a child's perspective being a child of someone in fire what what are some things that what's some advice you would give that's i i don't know if i've thought about that ever um I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm obvious, well, not obviously, but I am not a parent, uh, and don't care to be, (laughs) but, uh, but I think that having a parent, uh, that's gone a lot is, is kind of hard, especially if you either don't have another parent and, or your other parent isn't super, uh, parenty, uh, it could be a little tough. So um, I, I just think that, um, but you, you still, as a child, want to be supportive. I and mean, that's how you're getting food and support is by that person working and being gone. And so I think just having um, fun when, when the parent is home and spending t- quality time with them uh, is super important. I know a lot of times uh, m- when I was a teenager, maybe I wasn't, you know, as I didn't spend an, a, as much quality time as maybe I could have. Uh, I was too busy doing other stuff, but I think, you know, it's, it's important to just recognize and appreciate and respect the sacrifices that that person is making too, to support us as children. Yeah. You know, my, my son is now 15 and I think you've both met him. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the things I started doing with him is when I would go, I mean, when he was pretty little, when I tried to recognize his sacrifice, like, cause you guys know his dad was gone all the time and so I would I when I was going to go on a a fire assignment or even just be gone for the day on something related I would give him a cut we called it his cut of overtime you know so he'd get his cut so he'd get one hour of my overtime whether I was gone for eight hours or 14 days he would get his cut you know one hour of overtime that when I got home I would give it to him, take him to the store, and he could spend it absolutely however he wanted. Because I think you're so right on recognizing the sacrifice on both sides. Parents sacrifice a ton. Beth, you were gone a lot, but you made money. You were um, helping, you know, a servant to the nation, right? Doing a lot of things that took you away from, from your kiddos. And Allison, you and Casey had to make a sacrifice and behave and not make it hard on your mom to be gone because it's it's the way it had to be. And I think that, that to write on that communication and that understanding of the sacrifice on both sides is, is so critical. Well, and culturally, you know, well, I guess it's not culturally, actually technology-wise back then, 
you uh, you couldn't just wait and get into service and make a call, right? You had to stand in that horrendous long line <laughs> <laughs> where people were fighting over, hey, you took more than your two minutes, and uh, it, you know the the proverbial uh, long long phone line, uh, you know, in fire camp. But uh, I, I I feel like it's uh, been a big improvement, and and we all know that we're not always in cell service. Uh, although, you know, we've come a long way with technology and cows, right? You know, yeah. cell cell on wheels uh and so uh so i think that uh it was definitely a struggle in those days to not speak to your kids for you know several days and then when you did uh you know if something concerning was happening it was really hard (laughs) although i mean i it's almost kind of annoying how often we have service at this point because i kind of like to live in (laughs) ignorance and just work (laughs) totally yeah yeah and when any family you know in you you have young children and you've got to work and you particularly when you've got to be gone like we just were talking about um you know, it's tough. And I mean, some might say, well, it builds character. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) Yeah, definitely does. But I would say that my mom is my best friend. And so it's definitely created like a strong relationship between us because we have that commonality, uh, you know, and we can just be straight with each other and talk straight, whether it's mean or nice, Uh, mostly mean sometimes, but in a loving way. I'm kind of thinking I wouldn't want to be in the room when you two go at it because it can be pretty entertaining. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, especially if there's a couple of beers involved. Uh, being in fire is not for everybody. It's uh, it's a hard, kind of a hard life to live, especially if you do have family and children and stuff like that. But um, it's definitely rewarding. So I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't try to persuade anybody not to do fire, you know, but definitely recognize that it's not for everybody you know and I just if it is a parent-child scenario it's it can be an awesome relationship if if you let it or are open to that do you remember uh, is there a point in time where you started to you know pick up on the conversations and think my mom's a firefighter. That's something. And then thinking it was just day to day life. I mean, honestly, yeah. like it's just been life for since I can remember. It's just that that's just our life. They probably learned to uh, appreciate lightning storms because uh, mm-hmm. we'd always get excited. At least the firefighter as a firefighter, you know, and Lightning and Loman would have a lot of thunderstorms. And uh, then and all the trees were burnt down so we could see it really good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's right. Because uh, they, yeah, she was. She would have been only three years old when the Loman complex uh, burned, pretty much burned all the forest around uh, Loman. So you know, in that sense, it's a little bit sad that uh, they didn't get to see that. But but you know, I we we've gone up there. We actually went up there a couple of weeks ago, and you know, there's little trees. They're coming back. I mean, probably uh, the next generation will be able to enjoy them. But uh, it definitely changed the landscape uh, for sure. Allison, you, you know, we know that you're Beth. You're done at the end of this year, yep. right? The end of the calendar year. Forty six years. You are. You're going to get your last, well, probably get your last paycheck whenever it gets processed, right? (laughs) Um, And be moving on to the next chapter. Allison, do you have advice for your mom? What do you hope for her and what's your advice to her to enter that phase? Well, um, it's something that we uh, continually work on. Uh, Honestly, you know, like I've mentioned and she's mentioned like this, this has been both of our lives, uh, more so hers. I mean, almost half a century, she's been working for the forest service in, in fire. And so that's kind of a huge deal and a huge transition. And so I think it's definitely going to take some work to be comfortable with that and, and, um, transition out of that because it's everything at this point. Um, so, I guess my advice, which we talk about quite often, is um, just chill out and like have some fun, just relax um, and uh, enjoy the small things in life and not have to always be worrying about something or waiting for the next stressor, you know, just uh, chill out and have a good time. And, um, you know, my 
brother lives in Hawaii and, 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 you know, we can go visit him whenever we want and stuff. And I think she can do that a little more often and just travel and, you know, like it's, there's summers have been gone for 50 years. And so uh, I think it'll just be cool to be able to chill out and, and just not be on NMAC calls three times a day. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. That's, I think that's awesome advice. And I hope you're listening, Beth, because you've earned it. Well, yeah, it is actually been, a, 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 it's been harder for me than I ever anticipated, you know, because, you know, it's two thirds of your life, basically, or two thirds of my life at this point. So I didn't anticipate, you know, the as hard as it would be. But fortunately, I have uh, my kids, especially Allison being right here, you know, uh, and they're both very supportive. And, so, uh, so I think it'll be fine. Um, it just, it just has been a, a tougher transition than I had anticipated for sure. Uh, but I'm not afraid of it. You know, it's just, it's not like, well, what am I going to do? I have lots of things, you know, I want to do, but it, it's just a big piece of your life, uh, you know, in any job really. But when you've spent this long at it and, and, you know, as we all know, it's a little different with fire because you do get really close to your coworkers and family. Um, and yeah, it's like a family, and it's it's just like your, it's just like your, your home at, uh, at, at times. So, but no, I'm looking forward to it, and I'm proud of Allison, and uh, just watched her ha- have this realization when she when she switched jobs out of the, the hot shots. You know, she got out of the hot shots and went right into. A job that was not very operationally I mean it was it had something to do with operations but and so you know seeing seeing you know those we all learn those lessons or you know create those situations for ourselves to go hmm what was I thinking you know but you don't sometimes you don't know what you don't know so I'm really glad that she's got this opportunity to, you know stay in operations for while your knees are still good and you're <laughs> I'm actually kind of pissed off about that because uh well at going back to uh her not over being overbearing or uh telling me what I should or shouldn't do I probably could have gone for a like hey Al are you sure you want to do that because I'm not really too sure that that's gonna be right up your alley (laughs) that's when you would want her to intervene Yeah. yeah but she was super supportive of me making a transition so anyways you know let let me make the choice which was it was a difficult choice to get off the crew. That's that is my family and always will be. But um, I'm she was there to support me throughout the whole thing. So uh, I just wanted to touch back on that. I, you know, I actually take that you know well because I I in you know hindsight's always twenty twenty and I thought well you know I probably could have put a little bit more thought into this and gone, but Al's very headstrong just like I am. I mean that's how we all came up, right? You know you you don't second guess yourself too much. So she went for it. And, and and then she made adjustments and, and, you know, was patient about it and, and um, you know, decided that, oh, it's probably a little too early to get out of the operations. And, and so sometimes I do, I, I appreciate she saying that, her saying that, because I do think that uh, I might have been able to influence it a little bit more. Although I have to say, I, I, she I didn't. Did, she tried I, a little didn't. bit, but she's right. I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, well. <laughs> Just, uh, she's not one that takes uh, advice well <laughs> sometimes. She gives you the old noted. <laughs> yeah, copy that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Beth, what advice, you know, would you give to Allison at, at this point in her career then? You know, what's a general piece of good advice for someone in the middle of their career right now? Oh, a couple things. Uh, I think she's certainly turned into a, a good leader, and I, I think she understands that servant leader piece, you know, and uh, I don't see a lot of advice needed in that realm. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, go with your go with your gut, uh, like we do in fire. And um, don't stay too long. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's times now after 46 years where I'm like, because I obviously had to get out of fire, uh, in a sense, when I turned 57. And I am that was nine years ago. So I, I've stayed, uh, I think maybe you could go five years beyond, uh, you know, <laughs> getting the boot, but uh, I don't 
know. I don't have any regrets, really, but uh, I, I feel like, you know, it, it, it might have been good to move move on a, a couple of years ago. But but in hindsight, it's it's all good. Uh, I'll we'll get retired, and uh, I don't think I'll be doing any AD in or anything like that. I think I'm just going to move on and, you know, try to get a few more years uh, out of this good life we have and, um, you know, do, do a little traveling and work on my house and stuff like that. So, but I would just, uh, I would just tell Al to, you know, she's learning lessons right and left. I mean, not right and left, but, you know, the, the choices we make and, you know, I'm sure the next time she makes a job, a position choice, you know, just give it a little more thought, uh, you know, not that she didn't, but, uh, but I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a tough thing. You when definitely you... want to know what you're getting yourself into completely. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, so, but I think, um, no, I, th- I hope she, I know she's, you know, I mean, and I've, I've heard other people say this too, with, with this business, you know, sometimes you get into it when you're a temporary and, you know, you think, well, I'll just do this while I'm working through college or for a couple of years until I figure out what I want to be when I grow up, right. As it were. And, uh, and, uh, you know, next thing you know, you find yourself 10 years down the road going, Hmm, well, I've invested all this. I've gained some qualifications, uh, and then it becomes a bigger and bigger choice to make a you know mid uh, career shift you know into you something just else described me right there like <laughs> right. oh yeah this is great and then huh <laughs> yeah suddenly I'm not, I'm not too sure I'll ever grow up so uh <laughs> we'll we'll see what happens there but yeah I appreciate that advice and I also know that I'll have you to bounce stuff off of when I need to so yeah I just hope that you are happy and healthy in retirement mom Yep. (laughs) That's pretty awesome. All right. I so appreciate the two of you taking the time to sit down. It's awesome to get in the studio where we can see each other and not be trying to do this over over I mean, I would much rather do this over beers or something, (laughs) but (laughs) it probably would have been um, fairly (laughs) quite a bit more colorful. Yeah. Um, But but I think it's it's been awesome. And I Beth, you know, I absolutely it's been a privilege for me to spend so many years in the Great Basin um, getting to, to work with you. And, and Allison, I do remember when you used to be, you know, like way before you were fighting fire. And um, it's pretty cool to see where, where you've gotten to and the legacy that, that you're building. I, I absolutely appreciate your time. And, um, well, and I, thank you. Thank you. Kelly and thanks for letting us do this in person because it is a lot better than it's just such a seems such an isolated situation when we try to do it over teams or zoom or something but it's uh, I appreciate you taking the time and being interested in our story so (laughs) yeah Yeah, I think a lot of people will be it's very cool very cool and I'll buy when we uh, when we can rally somewhere I'll buy all right all right thank you thanks A big thanks to Allison and Beth for sharing their story and unique experience. They offered such good lessons on a variety of thought-provoking and relevant topics such as leadership, identity, difficult decisions, and family. Storytelling is an important component to learning. Listening to each other's stories helps us grow personally and professionally. I hope you heard some nuggets that will resonate with you. For opportunities to further the dialogue about these and other topics, be sure to visit our blog at wildfirelessons.blog. Comments are always welcome. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you for listening to the Wildfire Lessons podcast. Be sure to subscribe, share, give us a review. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Wildfire Lessons. For more information, visit wildfirelessons.net. Music provided by second generation smoke jumper Steve Baker, who always likes to keep one foot in the black. Thanks, Steve. Remember, we honor through learning.